Um, good evening and welcome. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us on Zoom. The Board of Directors and I are grateful for your participation and support and for sticking with us. Tonight's presenter is Peter Radford. Peter is the publisher of the Radford Free Press, a blog on economics covering contemporary issues and the state of economic theory. More broadly, he is also a writer and consultant on economics and business theory. He is a co-founder of the World Economics Association and he serves on the executive committee there. He is active in our Manchester Dorset community, serving on the board of the Southern Vermont Arts Center and he is president of Green Mountain Academy. He also moderates GMAL's weekly roundtable and a special economy roundtable discussion group that meets every other week. And he's been a participant in our great GMAL debate in past summers. Always a pleasure to have you, Peter. Thank you for tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for turning up. Let me test my uh, Zoom skills. I'm going to put up my uh, presentation. Hopefully you can all see that. And I'm going to put it there. That I hope is, is can everyone see me? Good. Well, I, I, I don't, I see a lot of nodding. So I'm going to take that as yeah, take that as yes. Um, the goal of tonight, I think the goal, my goal for this evening is simply to try to um, put color and dimension to the uh, discussion yeah, it's okay. that, seems be, that seems to be going on uh, in the it's going on in the background right now uh, about the role of the Chinese economy in the world, the way, nature of its change, and the and the impact that that dynamic is going to have, particularly obviously on the United States. When Derek and I first started talking about this last year, I don't know quite when it was, it was July, August last year. The, the, the trade talks and the, the arguments over tariffs were up front and center in the news. Of course, lots happened since. So, uh, so that doesn't mean it's no longer pertinent. I'm going to, I'm going to take my comments in, these, in this, uh, 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 break it down in this way. I'm going to look at the trajectory of the Chinese economy. I'm going to look at the nature of its change because it's changing radically. I'm then going to focus on the connections trade and the influence. I'm going to leave BRI more to Derek, but I'm trying to set the stage for him there. I'm then going to talk a little bit about the constraints on the Chinese going, uh, as, as they go through this tremendous growth and the, and the change they're trying to, to, to implement. Then I'm going to uh, end with some comments about the uh, ramifications. Why, why, why is this such an intensely uh, controversial subject? Uh, start with, uh, you wouldn't, you, I don't think you'd see an American president say something like this. This is Premier Wen back in 2007. The biggest problem with China's economy is that, well, as you can read, pretty much everything's wrong with it. Uh, growth is unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unstable. And it's telling that he would say that in public because the Chinese don't like instability, lack of balance, lack of coordination or unsustainability. So it was, this was a very powerful statement. And a lot of what's happened since, and a lot of what goes on in the relationship with the United States is a direct consequence of them trying to deal with this instability, you know, lack of balance, coordination, and so forth. So it's, a, it's an interesting comment to take into account. Okay, let's set some basic facts so we can understand China, uh, the, the, the Chinese economy in the proper context. This is a laundry list. It's the largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity, gobbledygook, don't worry about it. Second largest economy in terms of nominal GDP. If you're American, you like to think in terms of nominal GDP, so you can still be number one. If you're Chinese, you like to talk in terms of purchasing power parity, because that makes you number one. I don't think anybody should worry about it because at some point the Chinese will be largest in both. We'll get to that. It is the world's largest banking sector, but it doesn't have the international prominence, of course, that the United States banking sector has. 
it has the world's fourth largest inward investment. By that, I mean capital investment flowing into China. It's the 11th largest outward investor, and that is growing and changing rapidly, which is something that I think Derek will probably get to. And that's where the Chinese are really trying to put their stamp on the world. It has the world's second highest number of billionaires. So it's a very entrepreneurial uh, economy. We, we should not treat it the way we would, let's say, treat the Soviet economy. It's not as centrally planned as, uh, as that. I'm going to skip the, the line in red because that's the most important number on this page. I'll get back to it. World's largest manufacturing sector. It is the world's manufacturer as, as we speak. It's the world's largest exporter. It's the world's largest, the second largest importer. It has 129 of the world's top 500 companies. And this bottom line is what really makes the difference. It has 783 million workers. Uh, that's a staggering number when you consist about what, seven times the number that the United States would have. Let's return to that middle, that middle comment. One of the controversial things, which I'll get to uh, later on, when the United States criticizes China is that we criticize it for behaving and pretending that it's a developing economy when it's really much bigger than that. It's a developing country because it's got its per capita in GDP is 73rd in the country. Of course, these numbers change on a regular basis. But uh, so let's say it's in the 70s. Their goal is to get to between 15 and 20. And when you're applying that kind of change to that larger population, the inevitable result is that the Chinese economy will be, at, whenever they get to that goal, somewhere between three and four times the United States. It's just a, 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 the power of numbers. So. I just wanted to put some basic facts in front of you. And then I'll give you a little more context because I think this is as much a uh, dry economic statistics. There's also a great deal of cultural underpinning here. China, of course, has a, a tremendously long history of administration. It's throughout its history, 2000 years of history, its default, whenever there's been a regime change or a change of empires or whatever, its default is that it is a highly centralized and highly organized state. It doesn't have the, what we would refer to as the Anglo-Saxon history of free willing individualism. And that creates a little dissonance in the conversation between the two countries, between the West in general and the United States and China. And just to put a stamp on that planning aspect, it is in the midst of its 13th five-year plan, the United States has no plan <laughs> in anything like this. It's in the midst of its 13 five-year plan. The emphasis on 5G technology, and I'll get to that in a minute, uh, biotech and alternative energy transportation is highly strategically focused. So, so I say the third bullet point here, it plans. And it, coming back to that comment by Premier Wen, it seeks to reduce the chaos of the marketplace and place it in a very well-constrained field of operation. Having said that, entrepreneurs can make fabulous fortunes. It is a, it, it is a highly entrepreneurial economy. It is, it is capitalistic um, in, in a very different way from the United States form of capitalism, but we should consider it and treat it as if it's a capitalistic economy. The point being that entrepreneurs in China, if they're gonna make a lot of money, have, are expected to further the interests of the state of China, along with making a boatload of money. Uh, we don't put the same kind of pressure on our entrepreneurs here in the United States, obviously. Um, I think we can leave the last two, the last two points. China currently thinks it's stumbled upon a superior, superior method for organization and growth. And that's based really on its success in, in, in its recent track record. And it also, I think, is looking forward and saying, how does it manage the relationship with the United States if as they all expect, and I think we should all expect, they become the dominant world economic power. How is that supposed to manage and how are they going to manage the relationship uh, with, with America going forward? So let me start getting into the, the weeds a little bit. And this is the, I just tried to give you some idea about the trajectory of, of the, the Chinese economy. It, it is staggeringly quick growth. 
in the context, in our context, if we look at a westernized context, three to 4% is really good anywhere in the developed West. <clears throat> China has been racking up numbers close to 10% uh, for a very long time. Uh, and as you can see, this, I'm just comparing um, uh, 2000 to 2015 here, China 9.6, US 1.8 clearly there's a big difference and if you look down this chart you can see the developing countries which are the red bars stretching across tend to dominate which is exactly what you would expect but the other point to draw out here is that the mo the, the best performing developed countries the highest ranked blue bars on this chart are all closely related to china in other words, the Chinese economy has been very successful in dragging growth or creating growth for its near neighbors. And we'll talk about that in, when I get to its trading relationships. Uh, meanwhile, if you look down the bottom, you've got the more developed, more stable, more traditional uh, economies, all racking the one, one and a half, two, if you're lucky, kind of growth rates. So China is clearly on a different path. Here it is just expressed by itself, and here I've gone back to 1952. The key thing on this, I try to get across, is the amount of growth that's taken place since 2000 is astonishing. And I think that's one of the reasons why China has found itself, or the relationship with China has found itself so... Uh, it stumbled into the conversation, I should admit, perhaps that's the way to put it. it, it 20 years ago, we weren't, cons we weren't talking about the great problem that the Chinese, Chinese economic growth represents, or the Chinese power that will come inevitably from being the largest uh, economy. It was hypothetical, or it was abstract in the distant future. Their rush to prosperity of the last 20 years has forced this topic onto the agenda. And he's forcing uh, the West, and particularly the United States, to have to react. So the only point of showing you this is just to see how much of that growth has been packed into that 20-year period. For uh, most of us, the big adversary coming out of the East uh, in the 1980s, of course, was Japan. And, and uh, J Japanese stumbled later on with demographic and uh, other issues. Chinese, and we should not treat China as the, in the same ways we treated Japan. China is here to stay. It will become a much more powerful economy. Here it is compared with the other big developing nations. <clears throat> the, uh, for those of you who come across this kind of stuff in the press, BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, the BRICS nations, the Wall Street loves, and the analysts love talking about it. The, here they are. Uh, China clearly outperforms the, the others. India is doing a good job of trying to keep up, but Brazil, South Africa, and Russia are all floundering. Uh, they're, they're, China has managed to develop itself so rapidly since 2000 that it's breaking away from the pack. But we do have to remember, I'm going to keep reminding you, it is still a developing nation. It is nowhere near the finished article. Having said all of this, their rate of growth is slowing down. Here's, here's the growth rates looking at some quarters going back to 2009. The, 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 the peak on this chart back, but just about just under 12% back in 2009. <clears throat> of course, they were depressed somewhat by the, um, uh, the uh, uh, react world contraction and world activity after the, the Great Recession. But they're now bumbling along, and I think the next chart is going to show you. Yes, they're, they're, this is the last few quarters, uh, 18 and 19. The red bar is China, obviously. They're now in that mid-6% range, uh, whereas, as you can see, the United States, if it does well, it's in the 2.5% range. The United States has got a lot more variability also. But that 6% range is a reflection of a couple of things. One is that the Chinese economy has is as it develops reaching that kind of stage and size where maintaining that 10% growth rate is becoming increasingly difficult. So six to seven to eight is the kind of target that they would have now. <clears throat> but it's also reflecting, I think, the, the um, changes that are going on inside the economy. So, and we'll get to that when I talk about the transitions it's going through. So that's the trajectory of it. Here's another way of looking at the two, comparing the two countries, the US and China. 
Um, blue line in this is, is the United States, red line is China. This is in nominal, this is nominal GDP, it's not adjusted. <clears throat> you can see that um, if you look at the slope of the line, the red line, post 2000, that's when the Chinese economy, as I've been saying, really took off. The United States has had this much more steady uh, uh, increase, as, it, as you would expect it to, being a much more uh, advanced economy. The, the, for those of you who really want to follow these kinds of things, you can see that little blip in the blue line when it got above the, the trend right before <clears throat> the, 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 the Great Recession. That's when the bubble, <laughs> the bubble blew it up a little bit and it had to come back. And this, the Chinese experienced the same thing in, in uh, 2015, they had a, a recession because they got a little ahead of themselves. As you can see, they got ahead of the trend. This is a comparison of nominal. This is a comparison when we adjust it for purchasing power parity and the Chinese have uh, just passed the United States. If you look at um, nominal terms, the United States economy is in the, what, the 21 trillion a year range. If you look at the Chinese economy right now, it's in the 13 to 14 trillion a year range, but obviously accelerating. If you were just and getting them both onto this kind of a scale, we're, we're about both in that 18, 19 range. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the, tra the, 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 the numbers are not important. It's the trajectories I'm trying to get across. It, we, we should not obsess over absolute numbers. We should look at the slopes of these lines. China is clearly taking off. Um, having said that, I want to return to that red number that I put on that early chart with the per capita uh, uh, GDP, because it's really important to keep that in mind, because I think that is the simple easiest takeaway from everything that we talk about this evening. The Chinese goal is to get their economy to a level of prosperity where per capita GDP is somewhere, as I said, in that 15 to 20 rank in the world. And here, what um, th this chart is doing is taking the 100%, the gray bar, the tall gray bar, that's the United States, and then showing everybody as a percentage of that. So Germany on the far right here, you can see it's just a little under 80%. China, as you can see over toward the green bar over towards the left, is just a little under 20%. To get to where they want to go, they're going to have to quadruple the size of their economy. And that is the profound problem that the entire world is facing. It's not just the United States. The entire world is having, going to have to deal with an extraordinarily large country that is relatively underdeveloped, that has a plan to become a developed nation. And if it does, and given their recent history uh, uh, and success, it, we should think it probably will reach that goal. Um, it will be, a behemoth that none of us, no one can avoid. We're going to go from a world in which the United States was the behemoth to a world in which China displaces it as that behemoth. And the, everything else we talk about, everything that I talk about the rest of the evening is revolving around the problems that relate or stem from that rate of growth and that shift in the balance of economic power. <clears throat> I'll leave the, uh, the diplomacy to, to Darrow. This is the thing you brought in per capita GDP, just to, as you can see, again, the takeoff in 2000, the acceleration that's taking place, and, and all of the profound implications within China and the world that follow from that. All right, so I said with that, so that gives you a picture of what China is doing in its current trajectory. It's, however you describe it, there is a profound, rapid acceleration in growth taking place, which has shifted China right up front and center into the world economic discussion. But it's going through a lot of change. As it follows that development path, it's following a very classic development path. Every country that has gone through this rapid kind of development has followed a very similar path. They all have idiosyncratic um, individual ways of doing it, but the path tends to be the same. You start out very early on with massive investment infrastructure uh, uh, investment, and the economy is top heavy in investment. 
you also there tends to be a, a, a preferential treatment and protection of domestic industry. There's nothing unusual about what the Chinese are doing in that regard. That the Americans have done it, the Germans have done it, the British have done it uh, in in the past, and it's each of those followed their development paths. Currency protection is also a very normal part of the development path, and as is maybe more specifically in the Chinese uh, uh, instance, heavy government involvement. That's the thing that probably makes their development path somewhat different. But they are at this transition point and their policies are changing. They've decided that they are now getting prosperous enough, they're now getting large enough, putting words in their mouth obviously, that they need to start acting more like a grown up on the world stage. So they ended their currency manipulation. They joined the big boys club or the big persons club, I should say, let me correct myself. The World Trade, they were the, the World Trade Organization. The Bill Clinton welcomed them in. They're shifting, and this is the, the, probably the most important thing on this. They're shifting their economy from being an investment-based economy to being more of a consumption based economy. I'll, I'll show you some numbers on that in a minute. <clears throat> and in order to do this, they're piling into uh, money into R&D. They're still investing heavily in infrastructure, but they are now shifting their emphasis on uh, investment to R&D. And interestingly, they're kind of beginning to, to downplay their uh, reliance on trade as an engine for, for their growth. As I said, I've said several times, their goal is to create a modernized, prosperous economy by 2014. That's 100. The, the significance of 2049 is the 100 year anniversary of the communist takeover. So it's an economy that's not just growing very quickly, but is now being deliberately put through some very significant change. Both of those, the trajectory and the transition, have implications for the rest of the world. Trying to tease that out in some numbers for you here. I'm not sure I do a very good job of it, but the, the orangey yellow bit is trade, the contribution of trade to the G, uh, Chinese GDP. And you can see in the recent years towards the right, it's really not a significant factor. The, the uh, uh, purpley bit is their investment. If you go back across the page, you can see that in the center there, it, investment was a very major component of their, their growth. Uh, but and the blue part, which is the uh, consumption, is beginning to settle down and is beginning to get towards 30, 40, 50% of GDP. I, I'll break it down for you in a minute. But the goal is clearly, as, you, as they are trying to build prosperity and build a middle class, they have to shift and start spreading that wealth around and build a, a, build a society that is able to consume as well as produce. They want to, and rather like the United States did in the early 1900s. This is a comparison of the two economies. In this case, the US is the popular one and blue is China. Uh, if on the left here, you can see what we, when we refer to the American economy, we always think of it as a consumption economy. 68% of GDP in 2017 came from, <coughs> came from personal consumption. Whereas the Chinese economy, economy is only 39, uh, 39, 40%. And the next two bars over tell the exact opposite story. Look at the 44% of Chinese GDP was investment, whereas only 17% in the United States uh, was from investment. And the, perhaps a more interesting number is the government, the contribution of government. The United States has more governments, but direct government spending than, than the Chinese do. Because this is based upon national statistics coming out of those two countries and they may not account for these. One of the problems we have as we go forward, I'll mention it when we get to trade, the two countries account for things somewhat differently. So uh, apples to apples is somewhat diff difficult to do. And then maybe more interesting because we started off uh, this discussing this last year because of trade and because of trade wars, um, neither country on a net export basis is really top heavy with trade. They're both very domestic oriented economies. I just mentioned uh, R&D is rising rapidly and you can see the gray bars are, are, are the, the absolute numbers. This is in local currency uh, and the blue 
line shows it as a percentage of GDP. It's probably better that I show it to you here. Um, this again in purchasing power parity basis. The United States still has an advantage in R&D, but it, that advantage is, as you can see, going quite quickly. And the difference between the two countries as the red, the purple line starts to catch up, and you can see it's probably projected to cross any time now. Uh, the difference between the two countries is that R&D in the United States is not planned, it's not organized. It's, it is what it is that whatever private, the private sector decides to invest in. Yes, the United States has um, some uh, government plan, uh, uh, organized R&D, but that has actually been downplayed in recent years, whereas the Chinese are very, very focused at the government level and on certain kinds of R&D. So I listed the obvious ones here. And these, uh, as I will tie it back in in a few minutes, these are all things that they see as fundamental to their ability to deliver on that focus 2049 uh, 49 prosperity but these this transition this transition as i've indicated is creating all sorts of tensions in in the world and i think we should just raise them and we can discuss them later but they would put them on the table china is actively protecting and giving privilege to its own large companies that puts u.s companies and obviously other nations companies at a disadvantage when they are in trading in the united states in in the china in china i think it's important to remember that american company production in china three or four times more of that is sold into china than is exported back to the united states the U.S. business is recognizing the future and the future of Chinese consumption power and is, is, is wants to play in that field. But currently, because of its developing characteristics and its a desire to build its own ability to play in that large market that it's creating, it's giving pr protection and privilege to its own large companies. So that's always a, a point of contention whenever the two countries talk about these things. For the same reason, China continues to place strict technology transfer rules on foreign companies. If you want to come and play in China and participate in this enormous consumption market where we're building for you and all those profits you're going to get from that, you're going to have to play ball and transfer technology. That's, that's very hostile to the way things are done in the West and is obviously a point of contention. China has been accused, I think it's just kind of amusing, accused of stealing foreign company intellectual property. Um, you know, pot calling the kettle black, everybody's done this kind of thing in the past. I, 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 you may not be aware, but back in the 1700s, uh, Britain was well known actually for kidnapping Swedish uh, iron makers and bringing them to Britain in order to, to bolster the British iron industry, which was obviously very successful. Uh, but we, we haven't managed to get, I don't think the Chinese have been kidnapping too many people. They do, however, uh, hack into and steal secrets. A factor here also is we, we've got to, I'm not, I'm not trying to take a pro-Chinese line here, but the United States does have more restrictive uh, or more, well, let me say, more generous intellectual property uh, protections for its own companies. Um, and, and so this, is, this stealing business is, is obviously a gray area. It needs to be dealt with. The United States needs to, to, to take a hard line on that. Another thing is typical of a developing country. China has weak regulation of its industries. Um, their product standards are, are consequently quite low. Their environmental standards are quite low. And periodically this pops up uh, in two ways. One is it gives Chinese uh, businesses a cost advantage. Two, periodically you'll read about some importation of uh, Chinese made products that uh, below standards, in the United States or have problems in the United States. Uh, as you would expect a developing country to have these problems, you would all also expect it to deal with those problems over the next few years. That's a challenge for the Chinese. Um, there's an accusation, of course, that China has stolen US jobs. That's not really true. The, the jobs that were moved to China were moved by United States private, the private sector voluntarily. Um, so that's, that's a, a bone of contention that I'm not sure is a, it has too much too much legs to stand on. 
And then there's this constant criticism I've mentioned a couple of times. China takes advantage of being a developing country. This is particularly true. You've heard it, uh, heard Donald Trump say this several times. It's particularly true when they go to the World Trade or uh, or uh, Organization to resolve a dispute. In the World Trade Organization's rule book, there is a different treatment for developed countries and developing countries. China, despite its size, despite its advances, despite its sophistication in some sectors, takes advantage, in uh, put that all in quote marks, of being a developing country, trying to get away with stuff that were it treated as a developed country, it wouldn't be allowed to get away with. And that does leave a, a sour taste in, in, in uh, some Western nations. Let's talk about trade and the connections uh, that China has developed. It's pretty clear here. This is straightforward. The United States is by far China's largest export trading partner. As you can see, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam are next on the list. There's a big issue here, which is kind of technical, that we shouldn't really get into the weeds too much on this, this afternoon, this evening. But the... This number is developed on what passes through customs. And the way that the Chinese calculate it and the way that the United States calculate it are not the same thing. So in fact, there's a, there, at one point in 2016 or 17, there was a hundred billion dollar gap between the two nations, the way that they reported it. The, but more interestingly, this uh, most of these exports or a large percentage of this i should say of these exports coming into the united states are coming in through intra-company trading this is this this is the consequence of the globalization of production and this 479 million uh, a million that i've got here does not reflect the value added uh, value added that China has created in that production cycle. So the iPhone is always the iconic example of the difficulty in calculating trade in this interconnected world. China only really at the, assembles the final product. There is not much Chinese, practically no Chinese technology value added in an iPhone. There's much more German value added in an iPhone. But because those parts are sent to China, everything assembled, and then it's sent to the United States. The United States records that entire con uh, uh, a series of events as an import from China, when in fact, it's importing lots of bits and pieces from Korea, um, mainly from Germany and some other nations. So this is a makes negotiating to reduce this number really difficult. Because even if you made your iPhones in the United States, you would now merely remove the labor component from the cost. And now you'd be having a big trade deficit with the Germans and the Koreans instead of, of, of China. So it, the way in which these numbers are computed, which is, sounds terribly technical and jargon related, but does have a great deal of impact on the way that, that each country views this problem. This is where China, the key import, uh, uh, China imports, and you can see it's heavily based in the Pacific Basin. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, I should have mentioned, is in the in in, in when I was looking at the um, uh, exports, it, there was a time when China would send goods to Hong Kong, and then Hong Kong would send them on to the United States. Uh, the, the Apple is a particularly large player of that game. At one point they would cross through the customs barriers into Hong Kong. So it would be then counted as an export from Hong Kong to the United States, not from China to the United States. Nowadays, they don't cross that customs barrier when they go to Hong Kong. The Chinese are increasingly just using uh, Hong Kong as a depot, so to speak. So the entirety of that uh, uh, import is coming from China. So there's not just the, the the numbers involved, but the nature of the way it's even transacted is changing. Um, I put on here, Germany is the largest trading partner that uh, China has with Europe. I think if I would put it on this, the number would be close to about 95, 96 uh, million. <clears throat> uh, this is US million dollars. 
Germany is emerging as a major, major player, though. And I think that Derek will probably refer to that next week. But there's, there's the Chinese are clearly looking at Germany as a way to trade into Europe uh, <clears throat> going forward. This is a hideous chart, um, but it does show the, 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 the sudden emergence of this trade deficit. Again, so much of our conversation when we discuss the Chinese economy and its, and its impact on the world and its impact on the United States is a function of this radical change since the year 2000. And hopefully this chart kind of gives you that. The, 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 the trade deficit that has uh, opened up radically since 2000, simply a function of what I was just mentioning. The, the way in which American private industry has shifted production or contracted production out into China um, is helped blow this right, uh, blow this up. This is not classic textbook economics where you've got China trading with the United States. You have to think in terms of Apple <laughs> trading, trading with the United, Apple trading back and forth, sometimes with China, China with a Chinese base, sometimes with a, a United States base. It makes, negotiating these kinds of things away very complicated um but then again we got into this kind of trade war circumstance uh, a year ago and we're still the, the negotiations are still ongoing this is a little complicated this uh, i picked it up from uh, another source um the buff bar was probably the one to look at the 15 percent tariff on chinese goods what would be the impact be it would, uh, it would, I think that the, the bottom line here is it would cost between the Chinese between two and a half million and seven and a half million Chinese jobs. Now, reflect that their workforce is 783 million people. That is not, that's, you know, it's, it's a tiny percentage of their entire workforce. So the amount of damage that you can do to China um, through this tariff uh, uh, approach is, uh, is, is not devastating it would certainly slow growth down by about a third of a percent to maybe one percent but it wouldn't devastate the chinese economy uh so tariffs trade wars of this kind of nature just are kind of meaningless somehow the two countries have to figure out a, a more constructive relationship going forward nonetheless we're stuck in these trade tensions and and they're not going to go away anytime soon the talks continue um, there is an agreement in place. It's kind of muddied right now by the U U.S. election process because the U.S. is really emphasizing farm products. Um, I can speak from very personal experience here. Some of you may know my, my son-in-law and my daughter uh, farm in Nebraska and they ship their soybeans or used to ship their soybeans to China. They don't do that anymore because of what's going on with the trade war. Um, China is committed to purchasing more farm products but they are also simultaneously renegotiating contracts, and I'm going to use soy product, uh, soybeans as an example. They are currently negotiating with both Brazil and Russia to replace all their imports of soybeans. Once this agreement terminates, the, the last a couple of years, once that once that agreement terminates, that. We're not going to flip the switch back and all of a sudden uh, American farmers are going to be able to continue uh, uh, selling their soybeans to China because China is going to replace that entire marketplace and they're going to buy uh, from uh, Russia and Brazil. I've been asked in the past, well, that simply means that the Americans will be able to send their soybeans someplace else. Not really because both Brazil and Russia are adding production. They're not just shifting current production. Then there's the current argument over TikTok. I'm, I'm sure you all use TikTok all the time. Uh, I hope you don't, but you do. You, you. It's uh, social networking. The argument is now over. This is, this, is how, this is how trade tensions can escalate into all sorts of funny, uh, in all sorts of arcane ways. The Chinese ownership of TikTok, the, the company that owns it, it, the, the, the problem is that some of the personal no, uh, amount of information of American users of TikTok find their way back to a server, uh, potentially could find their way back to a server in China. The United States has suddenly decided this is a bad thing um, and wants the Chinese to divest of TikTok. It, we've got the same kind of problem with Huawei, only it's a little more complicated because there's a direct Chinese state involvement in Huawei. There isn't in TikTok. Um, the problem with Huawei is that it is 
the preeminent 5G technology. So uh, it, again, this comes back to some things I was saying before. The Chinese have made a concerted effort to, to stimulate five, the, their technology development. That's paid off. Huawei is now a leader in 5G technology. The problem is it's closely related to, or the, the accusation is it's closely related to the Chinese government. So the West is trying to shut down importation of products from Huawei. This is a bone of contention, obviously, but it also shuts down the acquisition of five, some 5G. Now, the United States is um, lagging behind development of 5G. So to the extent that it prohibits the, the use of Huawei, it's going to slow down its uh, expansion of five, its own 5G uh, network. Um, China is behind its commitments. There was the agreement in place. That's why the talks are going on. The China is behind its commitments to purchase more U.S. goods. And the target was 77 billion more this year. It's behind that because of COVID. So there's going to have to be some conversations to admit it. But these tensions coming from the, the speed of Chinese development and the tra transitions that it's going through and its arrival on the stage and the awkward nature of the Chinese relationship with American private enterprise rather than the United States government all roils around and makes these conversations very difficult to resolve. Um, this is a complicated. I'm just trying to show you, however, that if you're willing to play ball with the Chinese and you look across the page to the right, the blue dots, Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, if you have strong trading relationships with the Chinese, their growth, their race to consumption economy will have dividends. You will yourself get higher GDP growth. We used to talk about the United States being the engine of growth in the world. That is slowly and surely slipping to the Chinese economy. Simple um, way of uh, trying to articulate the potential damage if you want to look at what could be the real downside in uh, jobs in the, in, within the American economy from uh, a trade, real all out trade war with the Chinese, which I hope we avoid. Uh, there's about two and a half million jobs in the United States directly resulting either from exports to China, imports from China, um, uh, investment to China or from China. So about two and a half million jobs. That's the number to keep in mind as a, as a, as a potential risk. Um, coming back a little bit to the accusation that China is uh, taking advantage of its developing country status and is a currency manipulator, you hear that thrown out. This is the exchange rate. It's strengthened, it weakened, it strengthened, it's, it's weakened again. You can see though that it's within a fairly narrow band and that's suggestive that there's some tinkering going on. Uh, but is China a currency manipulator? Well, the definition of a currency manipulator is a nation with a large current account balance, not trade balance, current account balance, uh, that purchases reserve currencies to keep its own currency low. Well, China really doesn't have a large current account surplus, and nor does it appear to be an active purchaser of reserve currencies, e, e, US dollar, to support its own currency. So it's really not a currency manipulator in the classic uh, application of that phrase, but clearly it does try to manage the value of, the, of its currency. Another topic that sometimes comes up when you, people start worrying concerning themselves about uh, China. Is their currency going to become the next reserve currency? Is the dollar going to lose its status as the world's reserve currency? Here you can see the pie chart. The United States is 62% of the world's uh, 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 reserve currency usage. The euro is 20%. The yen is five. And right over there, you can see the Ch China, China coming in at two. Um, it's got a long way to go. <laughs> Let me put it that way before China replaces the, the Chinese currency replaces the, the U S currency as a, the world's reserve currency. Having said that, I can easily envisage a time 30 years from now when that, it has arrived at that status simply by virtue of the size that that economy is going to be back out there. A um, couple of brief points to make there. China still maintains capital controls, which makes it difficult for the one to play a, a, a major international role. And the current tendency, the United States policy of the last few years, plus the 
its economic policy going back further has started to um, uh, impel some nations to use regional reserve currencies so that for instance even if you're not in the euro european country would use the euro asian countries use the yen or the one but uh, there is no threat to the dollar any uh, immediately now let's talk about constraints all of this is glowing the chinese economy is going gangbusters they're making all sorts of nifty changes it's having a dramatic impact on world trade and on the way in U.S. private sector behaves as it as it looks forward to future marketplaces, but there are constraints. This is not going to be easy. And the biggest single problem that Chinese face is they've got a major demographic problem coming up very soon. Uh, their workforce, which is gigantic, is not growing at the rate uh, that it used to. And I'll. And when I when I started making um, uh, talk do, giving talks on the economy, I was always told that uh, how to answer people. Well, what's what, what's what's important to economic growth? Well, number one, a growing population it, with a growing workforce and a growing ability to consume. Those two things create uh, naturally create a growing uh, economy. The Chinese, if they're going to meet that goal have a major problem because their population is slowing down. Its productivity is too low to fill that gap. And then I want to discuss a little bit, it's got a lot of ways to go yet in its own internal administration. I'm going to take a stab at uh, the, 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 um, the demographic issue. I'm going to start actually ironically by looking at that, but looking at uh, this chart, which shows you the component of labor as a con contribution to growth. Back in the early days, it was a much larger component. You can see it's, it's becoming less, much less significant. Whereas the green bit at the bottom is becoming, at the top is becoming much more significant. Giant China, a country that has lower workforce growth, but still wants to grow its economy, needs to have higher productivity to fill that gap. Uh, and China is investing furiously in, in R&D, as I mentioned earlier, to try to create that productivity. Here's the problem. You can see the flattening out of the working age population. If I projected that forward 10 years, this line starts to dec decline. If they're going to continue to try to hit that 2049 goal of being a moderate prosperous nation for the entire population they've got a they've got a lot of uphill work to do it's a major major issue for them the United States benefits from a growing population doesn't have the same issue to set some parameters around that the size of that problem if you look far left here, 3.3% has been their annual productivity rate growth, and they were generating something like 10% uh, GDP growth off of that. If they want to get to 10, to keep that same number, go all the way to the right on this, they're going to have, because their population is flattening out and their working age population is flattening out, they're going to have to get to 5.5% productivity growth. And that's a big step. It's a very big challenge. So the Chinese have a, a tremendous productivity issue ahead of them, which helps explain why they're so keen on technology transfer, it helps explain why they, they want to, uh, they, they go around stealing people's intellectual property, helps explain why they're investing heavily in R&D. The third one, this is a lot on a page, but so let me just kind of try to summarize it. Because it, the, it's, a, it's an aspect of the two, it's an interesting contrast with American culture. If you move from Vermont to Connecticut and then lose your job, your unemployment is paid by Connecticut, not by Vermont. That would not be the case in the, in the Chinese system. If you moved from Vermont to Connecticut in the Chinese system, because you're considered to be a resident of Vermont, no matter where you live, your unemployment would be paid by, by, by Vermont. Why is that important? Because the Chinese urban population has exploded and about a quarter of that population is not, are not official residents of those cities. So when the Chinese economy slows down, as it did in response to the COVID crisis, a whole bunch of people get up and go home. 
because they want to collect their benefits back in their home, wherever they we'll use an American word, domiciled back in the countryside. They go back and start farming and, and so forth. That has tremendous downside for productivity because China, just like in the United States, the cities are the epicenter of high productivity. So if you have the risk periodically of losing people every time you get a bump, because they want to go and collect their benefits in their hometown. You've got, you, you've got an administrative system that is producing um, uh, sort of like, a, it's a constraint on the ease and the flow of population, on the ease and flow in which you can boost that productivity by getting high skilled workers into the cities. Um, so we've got this odd situation developing in, in, in China, which is kind of analogous, I suppose, to what's going on in the United States, where you've got cities, rapidly growing populations with competing for high skilled workers but that where that they're still a lot of those workers not considered official residents of those cities so they they tend to up and skedaddle um when there's a when there's a crisis so the administrative system it's a vast vast country and it is still only a couple of decades into this this explosion of growth and it is facing this enormous need to reform its basic administrative um, uh, functions it would and and it was recent it was reformed as recently as 2014 that's already obsolete they're thinking of trying to reform it again to allow cities to encourage cities to give residency to these the, to to the newly urban population to prevent this ebb and flow of people so that you get a much more american style system where people can go to the big jobs and stay and if they uh, unfortunate that it's that city's or that state's responsibility. So China, because it's developing so rapidly, has still got this legacy of old fashioned administration that is, uh, is, is a major constraint on its growth. All right, guys, I'm getting uh, all the way through. Let's just get to, the, to discuss some of the issues, try to summarize them a bit. Um, Number one, we've got to remember that the American trade policy is driven by the private sector, not by the government. The United States does not have a national strategy for anything when it comes to economics. It's like there's an economic policy from the Fed on monetary policy. There's not much fiscal policy or economic policy coming out of Congress. Uh, the shift of supply chains to China and the move to be part a participant in Chinese growth is very much a reflection of private sector decision. That's where they can make profits. Um, you know, as consumers benefit from the lower prices we get because of that production, 900 bucks per household, you can use that as a kind of a proxy if you ta if you taxed away, tariffed away, tax and tariff, same thing. Um, you would, you could go, you could potentially raise uh, taxes on U.S. households by 900. Of course, the, the theory is that they would then U.S. households would be sensible and not buy China's Chinese goods because costs are up, and will buy Vietnamese goods. That's presupposing that Vietnamese are actually making those goods, and that's not always true. Um, the United States manufacturing sector has obviously suffered somewhat in this, but it was going to lose jobs under any circumstance to automation. And it's the same thing if you reshore that manufacturing, it's gonna be automated anyway. It's not gonna con uh, 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 contribute to employment growth. Um, US policy is just confused. It's, it's very interesting to watch. The, the United States is having to deal for the first time with a really legitimate economic competitor. It's, it's, it saw off the Japanese in the 1980s because the Japanese approach was not sustainable. There are Japanese, major Japanese presences in certain industrial sectors. But the big difference is that Japanese economy is not the same presence. It doesn't have the same footprint. It can't. It doesn't have the demographic heft that the Chinese do. It's, it's the demographics that make this a major, major problem for the United States to deal with. Um, China is by far the fastest growing market for US business. US business really, really, really wants to do business in, in China. So somehow at the governmental level, the two countries have to coexist or get on. Either that or the US business gets excluded and there's a risk of a division opening up 
because of the contention that's going on. And then that's a loss of profit for US business. Um, I just threw this gratuitously at them. The US really needs to adapt. Um, and and it, it, the game the US has played for m decades is that it is the world's largest uh, mass market. It, it, it gives its production, it gives American companies an enormous economic advantage that they have a domestic market that is unparalleled in the world. That is no longer true. Chinese companies are going to have that advantage in the future. And that changes the dynamic around the world. Um, I'm sure Derek will do a much better job of this, but you can see the, 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 the struggle, the power struggle that's emerging simply because China has now got this economic gravitas. It's got this heft. It now can start having a much more active interfering foreign policy. Derek will talk about it, but I just thought it'd be interesting to see. They spent about 1.2 trillion on BRI. I think Derek can correct me next week, or show me how wrong that is. But the United States hasn't got the ability to muster the same amount of aid. So if you're trying to get African nations to play on your team, you don't have as many chips to play as the Chinese do. And it, it, this relative size is going to become a major component of that conflict. So let me just wrap all this together because I've been prattling on for a long time. There's absolutely no way around China. It's not like Japan. It's not like Germany. It's not a country that can be outcompeted en masse. It's in this astonishing rush to prosperity. It's unparalleled. There is no country ever to, uh, uh, accomplished anything like this. It's got major obstacles to overcome. I didn't get into the politics. I didn't get into any of that, but I, I think we should consider they've got political problems domestically. They have to, the Communist Party has to deliver on this promise. Otherwise, there's gonna be a lot of social unrest. Uh, ultimately, trade's really not the issue between the two nations, US and China. China's just gonna dominate through size alone. So trade wars are totally pointless. Uh, but the thing America, Americans and its policymaking really needs to understand, that size that China is going to get to will shift the center of gravity of so much of the international economic rulemaking to China. If you look at the, the world system for the last um, several decades, it, it's been built on American rules. It's been built because America wanted it there. The IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and so on. And they are still very much identified with the United States. We should start, we will start seeing Chinese uh, alternatives evolve. And I think we should get used to that. Um, and I want to throw this in at the end just to be annoying. Uh, it, 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 China has got a great advantage right now because the U.S. economy is stagnating. China, the United States has not done a good job of keeping its own growth rate up in order to make itself prosperous uh, and put itself into a good competitive position. Uh, and I can't imagine uh, anyone saying this next year, but perhaps they would. We could emulate uh, uh, Premier Wen and perhaps we could come up with a coordinated American uh, economic policy to, to compare to the Chinese. Um, I don't think we're going to see any of this. So. That, ladies and gentlemen, is all I've got to say. I think we've got about half an hour left. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, we'll go into Q&A now. Um, so please uh, type your questions in the chat box. You'll notice I didn't mention TTP. Uh, the, and I didn't because it's, it's kind of past tense and is a lost opportunity on the part of the United States. Um, what would it, I think that the, 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 the advantage that the TTP, the trade agreement that the United States that Obama had put together and um, the advantage it would have given to the United States would, it have, would have been able to, uh, to muster uh, Asian, Asian allies in order to try to offset some of these um, uh, more aggressive Chinese trading practices and 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 the ability of the Chinese to write the rules of trade out in that in that marketplace. By walking away from that, I think the United States has left the Japanese, the Australians, and so forth to have to deal bilaterally 
with the Chinese, and it's kind of put them all in a much weaker position. It's 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 given uh, still it's given uh, the, the the Chinese a much stronger hand, and I think so. It's a major strategic error um, because I think the, one of the whole purposes of that getting that trade agreement together was to try to create a united front uh, on some of these issues and force China to deal. Uh, uh, with, with with a cons kind of a consortium, if you like, um, and I think I think that the um, uh, the loss of that is a is the is the is the, is the surrender of a major uh, uh, card that I think that I think that um, uh, the, the U.S. is going to regret down the line because it's it, it's forced a lot of American allies into a weak position, and I'm not sure I'm not sure that uh, that that's so. Uh, uh, a good thing to do to your friends and allies. Next up, who do you okay. want to? Um, Bruce McGlory, um, uh, yeah. first question, uh, asks if you would talk to changing role of state-owned enterprises. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, the Chinese the gro growth, the, the, this, this is very much, uh, there's a, a, a very heavy uh, uh, element of private sector growth in it. But obviously, the, the, a major difference between the United States and China is that there are these very large state-owned enterprises. The, United, the, the Chinese uh, give privileged access to capital, and then they take they take direct ownership of that. Those co those companies. It's interesting because one of the, one of the problems I think that that um, uh, uh, creates for the Chinese is that they are they are they're saddled with down the road. I'm talking down the road, Bruce. Uh, they're going to be saddled with um, just as the Japanese were for a while, they're going to be saddled with corporations or organizations, enterprises that are, uh, aren't as uh, nimble as they could be. So it, it, it's, it, yes, they play a major role and it, it, it introduces the Chinese state as a player in, in commerce, which is uh, something we're not in the West used to seeing. Um, except, of course, uh, maybe you could use a parallel some of the aerospace industry, which has got heavy hand of governments behind it to make them uh, profitable. Uh, and I think that the complicating factor that, that from there is it becomes political. It's like, it's like if, if, if a Chinese state owned enterprise is involved in, let's say, a desire to purchase a, 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 an American company, which I can see as a problem down, uh, down the road. Um, you, 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 you're introducing potential conflict. And, and what I'm concerned about is that that would then open up or potentially open up a political gap between and make it more difficult to negotiate. The Chinese state capitalism and American free enterprise capitalism are going to be at loggerheads. They play by different rules. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and the existence of the state-owned enterprises is going to be a major niggling factor in that potential conflict down the road. Um, I hope I, that, that kind of gets something of an answer to that question, but uh, they are a problem if you, want, if you want a short answer to that. What's up next? Bruce uh, followed up with another question. U.S. for years believed economic growth would cause China to move toward Western values. Is that a dead end? <laughs> Did end. Uh, the answer to that is yes. I mean, I, I think that the Chinese, uh, uh, they, this get, kind of gets back to the, the, the point I was making about the social contract. If, look at it as a kind of a social contract. It's not a social contract between the government so much as the social contract between the Communist Party and the rising middle class of China. The, the, I, I think the Population of China will live with the authoritarian nature of the current regime in China, so long as that regime delivers the economic goods. And that does not necessarily mean, I think the United States was being very naive thinking that uh, China would suddenly you know, throw off the, this authoritarian nature or throw off the centralized nature and become more Western. Um, I tried to get at that a bit, Bruce, when I when I put that chart up about the right at the beginning. It, Chinese got a two thousand year history of highly centralized, highly government uh, organized administration. Uh, it's not going to give that up. It's a cultural difference between the two nations. I think 
having said that, is this interesting existence of entrepreneurial activity in China? So it's it's um, there's a, there's an uneasy coalescence or in, in this Chinese version of capitalism. As long as they deliver the goods, I'm not sure that there's going to be a tremendous progression towards what we would consider Western value. I think what that's what you mean by Western values being much more of an individualistic kind of free for all. They're still going to have a very heavy dose of uh, Chinese government, i.e. Communist Party influence over development trajectory, uh, over what industries they're going to encourage, over what technologies they want to, want to get into. And the way in which, even the way in which they interact with the United States, uh, you can't treat them as a, you can't treat the dealing with China in the same way that you'd deal with Italy or France or Germany or the United Kingdom. You're not speaking the same language necessarily. Uh, and China, of course, is willing to play a very long term uh, 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 game as opposed to the much shorter term game that uh, Western nations tend to play. So, yeah, dead end. Yeah, at least in the interim, I think, yes. Okay. Um, Gail asks, what are the risks of military confrontation? <laughs> that's, that's Derek. Ask Derek that next week. Um, uh, low. I, I would say low, just simply because there's just, uh, both countries need each other. It, 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 there's just, if you think, of, think, about, think about the pressure on American large corporations in the United States, uh, United, I should say in the United States, uh, Apple, uh, General Motors, uh, the, the, the interconnection between the two economies now is, is very, very uh, tangled. Um, there's not much to be gained. The Chinese economy, it, 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 my perspective coming from where I come from, when the Chinese have emerged as a fully developed economy, the size that that economy is going to be implies tremendous opportunity to exert power around the world. Just by virtue of the fact of what they will be able to afford, just by virtue of the fact that they're going to be everywhere. Just like the United States had that run after World War II, the Chinese will have a similar run. Um, and I'm not sure who I can think of to knock them off, but yeah, low, I think, Gail, but ask, ask, ask Derek, he'll contradict me. He'll probably say hi. There you go. Can I, can I chip in in the answer briefly while we're in the point to the Gail's question about military confrontation? Yes. <clears throat> I too think it's very low. Uh, neither the US military nor the Chinese military want to get involved in a, in a direct military confrontation. If it happens, it will be uh, as a result of a, uh, an unfortunate incident, uh, like the incident that set the Vietnam War going. Uh, it will be an unfortunate incident where each party feels to, that they have, to have a need, a military need to, to respond. But generally speaking, neither the US military nor the um, uh, Chinese military really want to get into that, if at all possible. There. So we have a question from Steve Sending. China is about to fall off a demogra demographic yes. cliff with perhaps the lowest fertility rate in the world. Can productivity increase fast enough to sustain Chinese economic growth at anything approaching the rate to which they aspire? Ah, that, I think that is, Steve, that is the big, huge unknown. Um, there is no answer to that question. They are desperately aware of it. They are trying everything they possibly can to deal with it. Uh, as I put on that chart, uh, to maintain growth, given that demographic thing, they've got almost to double their uh, productivity. And when you think about it, they're a developing country. They've got an enormous rural population that is a drag on productivity at the moment. So they've got to move all those people into more productive uh, uh, jobs. They've got to invest like crazy in R and D. Uh, and as I said, it, it puts it, it puts them under enormous pressure which adds to the tension, the, the trade tensions between the two countries, or the political tensions between the two countries, because they're looking over their shoulder the whole time, worrying whether they're gonna, they've committed to this goal, 
are they going to hit that goal? And I think we're, we would be right to be skeptical that they can do it. Um, having said that, their recent track record is stellar. So do you want to bet against their ability to do it? I don't know. Um, the, 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 they are also, don't forget, Steve, an authoritarian nation. They can force people to do things <laughs> to create the, the, the kind of results they're, they're looking for much more uh, uh, ably than a Western country could. So, yeah, I, 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 you hit the nail on the head. That's their biggest single risk. Whether they can do it or not, I don't know. And I don't think, I think they can force people to have babies, Peter. <laughs> No, I don't. No, I'm, I'm saying moving them to cities, trying to get them into industries and so forth that would help move that number. Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge issue, Steve. It's a huge issue. So, I, I, um, and as it comes back, it, 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 it's, as, as I think I was saying, um, some of that lays behind the, their, their forced technology transfer, some of, all of, some of the things they're doing. Uh, which the West doesn't like and the United States doesn't like in particular, to acquire technology and deploy technology is, is precisely driven or heavily driven by that, by that knowledge that they've got that issue coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I mean, it, it, it's, the, the answer to your question, the honest answer to your question is we don't know. Right? That, that's the honest answer to that question. We have a question from Steve Williams. Any ideas for possible U.S. actions to further the U.S. position? <laughs> well, I, the problem I've got with uh, that is that the United States, it, again, it comes back to the, two, the differences between the two countries. China is in its, it's in its 13th five-year plan. There is no five-year plan for the United States to rehabilitate its economy, launch new technologies, subsidize those kinds of industries. We subsidize, the United States, don't forget, subsidizes industries all over the place. I mean, we complain when the Chinese do it, but the United States does it all the time through the tax code and through various other forms of relief. Um, but the, Uni the United States doesn't have a concerted view of, it's never had to have a concerted view. It's been top dog. It's never faced this challenge. It, it, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the first things, Steve, that the United States needs to do is to have a, a think about what it wants to be. It, it's no longer going to be the largest mass market in the world. Its industries are going to have to compete on some other basis. Either that or they're going to have to do all their business in China, which itself is an interesting uh, challenge. I, I, it, one of the things I think that, that the United States needs to do is to, is to get its growth trajectory back from 2% to more like 3 3.5%, but that's some heavy lifting. And there's some structural things that need to be done that have been neglected for a very long time. I mean, um, a better an enforcement of antitrust rules to make uh, a, a American companies compete more effectively in order to lower costs to consumer, to increase in rates of innovation, uh, reduce the, the, the protection of intellectual property somewhat to get it diffused into the economy more rapidly, uh, to force uh, our large companies, the, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Apples, to be more competitive, face tough upstart competitors credibly and, and therefore increase American growth. One, it's, it's a, Thomas Philippon uh, wrote a very good book I'd recommend on this. It, it, it's, it's why America gave up on free markets. If you look at the American economy right now, it is not as vibrant as it should be. And it were it, it would be generating more prosperity and wealth for its own citizens. And this tension with China could be downplayed somewhat. So I, I, that's a very roundabout way of answering, Steve. But I think getting some, getting, getting, cleaning up its own act may be the first step to being able to deal with China. If the US got its act together in ways I won't specify here and is asking, and is asking a lot, might it be able to preserve its position as the, or at least a major reserve currency? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. I mean, I, th I think the United States um, needs to get its, uh, it, it, to, it needs to, both countries have enormous issues with inequality. 
the problem that but they're, they're, that source of inequality is very different because in china it's because they haven't yet fully developed and moved that uh vast pool of rural workers into the middle class and into the cities and into more productive ways of life and more prosperous ways of life the united states the problem in of inequality kind of stems from what i was just saying it's kind of kind of got a bit of a sclerotic economy at the moment where too many of its major business sectors are dominated by big big companies and historically we know that that kind of economy tends to grow more slowly um if it could if it could stimulate that growth yes i think you were asking specifically about the res its reserve currency status yes i think that would help protect that re reserve currency status because i think that the world would see the us dollar in a different view if it were um uh, if it were a country that were generating three, three and a half percent growth, as opposed to top two, two and a half percent. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's an interesting angle on it that probably needs a little more thought than I've just given it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. This one, Asian, Asian populations appear to be more tolerant of government suppression of human rights. With growing prosperity, can this continue to be the case indefinitely in China? Um, that ties back to Bruce's, uh, uh, con you know, convergence on Western values. Um, it, it, they're, they're kind of interesting sides to the same same coin. I, I would think that that I, it comes back, Steve, to what I was saying. The, 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 they've got this pact. The Communist Party has this pact with its population that they and only they are going to be able to deliver this prosper prosperity. If they fail, I think, yes, there's going to be social political ramifications for the Communist Party that, um, that uh, uh, could destabilize and, and potentially over overthrow it. So I, the answer is I don't think it can be indefinite. I, I think that kind of thing will change. Yes, you saw it, you've seen it in Hong Kong, haven't you? I mean, it, it's, it's analogous to Hong Kong. It, it, it's, it, it, those values can embed themselves. Uh, and I think that, I think we, um, we, we, we can't predict that the, they will be able to repress indefinitely. Yes, go ahead. Do we know enough to say that the US economic policies toward China would be significantly different under a Biden led democratic administration? I well, we kind of addressed that a little bit before, but I, I think, yes, we do know enough. Um, it's a, to, just to the extent that I think that a Biden administration would probably revert to a more traditional US approach to these kinds of matters and wouldn't be as uh, confrontational and transactional, I should say. Um, I'm not sure that you'll see a return to TPP, uh, to TTP, but um, I wouldn't mind betting that there will be a, I think we know enough about him and we certainly know enough about the people around him, potentially around him, to say that, that uh, they, they would favor a much more multilateral approach to dealing with the China, Chinese and the Chinese problem. Um, and that may refer, re, uh, mean a return to some kind of more negotiated multilateral relationship with Asian allies and, and trading partners. But yes, I think we do know enough to say there's going to be a change. What that change would be, I think it's A, more engaging and less hostile, less transactional and more multilateral. Okay. Um, and just, um, I guess, last question, Gail, um, what uh, the impact of the former one child policy on population growth trends now? Well, that's what that's coming back to St Steve Sending's issue. The, the one child policy is, is the is the root cause of the major demographic collapse <laughs> that's uh, impending. That's what Steve was driving at. And um, they're gonna there's, there's there's a huge consequence coming up it's it's rolling down the hill towards them and it's going to make major will have a major major impact there's no question yes 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 hence their need to become more productive and so forth okay well with that uh we will end and i just want to thank you peter for uh yet again another um outstanding lecture um i want to thank you all for being here um it's great to see everybody and I hope to see you at, uh, especially next week's lecture with Derek Boothby, 
Um, that's September 8th, the Belt and Road Initiative. And please check our website and um, sign up for more programs. We look forward to seeing you and have a good night.